Just to say, it's a joy for us to welcome you, brothers, uh, here with us. Thank you for coming. Thank you. And it's a, it's a blessing for us to be here in your home and for you to come to us today. So thank you. Um, just to explain, uh, we're going to have a panel now with uh, the four worship leaders and Matt and Audrey. Um, so I'm just going to ask the guys to introduce themselves, just say a little bit about who they are and what they do here at IHOP. And then probably 20 minutes will be about kind of praise and worship and some kind of practical spiritual questions. And then the next 20 minutes will be about building unity and questions of, of unity uh, and how we can grow as, as brothers and sisters. So just over to the four guys. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, as Keith said, my name's Nathan. Um, I actually just recently, six months, months ago, uh, moved away from Kansas City, so I came back to visit for one thing. But uh, I came here in 2005, so it's a very important year. Um, I actually, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is four. Uh, there's actually some people from St. Louis, Missouri here. I met a few of you. Awesome. Um, but in 2000, 2001, around that time, you know, I, actually in 99, I came here to Kansas City to see the trailer because everybody was like, yeah, there's this place that's doing prayer and worship. And I'm like, man, those are my two favorite things. I like prayer and I like worship. So I had been professional musician going everywhere and I walk into this room. Okay, what? Where is it at? Like, what's going on here? Back in 99, it was in this, you know, double wide trailer with the wrestler mats on the ground. And, and uh, it was kind of stinky. It was kind of smelly. And it was usually one person playing a piano and maybe like five or six people reading a book. And I remember going, okay. I remember thinking in my brain going, okay, this is it. But I knew in my heart, I remember a seed going, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. So I remember in, my, in St. Louis, I had started help uh, raise up a, a prayer ministry, the, the House of Prayer in St. Louis. And I moved here in 2005, and then I was a worship leader from 2005 till basically last year. Had a bunch of, been on, I think we've all been on each other's teams, I think, yes. at one time or another. And so that's me, and this is my buddy. <laughs> Nathan was my section leader, which is in, which in the IHOP world is like my boss-ish, but he was also my drummer, so that was really interesting. <laughs> so he would tell me what to do, and I'd tell him what to do. <laughs> um, my name is John, uh, John Thurlow. I've been uh, in Kansas City since 2004, uh, and I lead a team of singers and musicians in the House of Prayer, uh, and love what I do. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing. Uh, my name is Justin Rizzo, and uh, originally from Buffalo, New York. And uh, 12 years ago, I uh, came out here to Kansas City. So my story goes, I was saved when I was seven, and uh, son of a pastor. And uh, my dad came to me when I was 12, and uh, he said, hey, I feel like there's a spirit of worship on your life, and I'm supposed to teach you how to play the guitar. Which when you're 12, you're like, okay, sweet, I don't really care, but whatever, you know. Now I'm 30, have my own child, and my, my parents are like amazing. And so, uh, really, it was through music, um, you know, because when you're a pastor's kid, it's really easy to live your spirituality, uh, it was for me anyway, through your parents. I mean, they do enough spiritual things to cover you, right? But when I was 12, it really took on a new form for me. When my dad taught me a couple chords and the guitar, and then I would just be in my room for hours learning new chords, writing songs, singing the scripture. And then when I was 16, uh, I heard of this place that does 24-7 prayer and worship. My first question was, why? Like, why would they do that? Uh, I wasn't like, rah, rah. I was like, why? But, uh, and I never liked school, but if you're in school, stay in school. But I, school. I hated it. Um, and so I came out here and I was like, well, I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing after high school. The first time I walked into the prayer room, uh, there's a couple hundred people in the room. And if you haven't, if you can't picture it, it's a room much like this. There's a platform and people just sing nonstop. And there was this whole band up there who was playing, worshiping, and they were crying out for revival in America at the time. And my little 16-year-old heart, when I walked in the back of that room, uh, I was just struck with two things. This is not a concert, and this is not a show. Um, they were ministering to the Lord. They were going somewhere with Him. And I was on row 15, invited to engage in that, but they weren't trying to, like, overtly impress me with what they were doing. And then obviously the second thing was just, this isn't stopping. So these guys played for two hours. They left the platform in this seemingly perfect order that it didn't stop. And then 15 new young people would be on there. I was like, oh, my gosh. So I walk next door. We have a coffee shop next door. 
uh, after about a couple hours, I started asking questions like, hey, what is this place? Who are these people? How do you do this? And they said, well, these are called prayer missionaries. They actually raise their own funds to do this 50 hours a week. They do 25 hours of prayer uh, to the Lord, and they do 25 hours of acts of service. And so I walked back uh, to that room that day, and I, I prayed a really sincere prayer to the Lord. I had no idea what I was praying. The Lord loves our prayers, even if they're super uh, immature. I was so sincere. Sat down in row 15 and said, Lord, if you'd make a way, I would give yep. myself to this for the rest of my life, if it's your will. Amen. And uh, so I went back home, talked to my parents, and different spiritual leaders in my life, and, um, and they just blessed it. And so uh, when I was 18, I moved out here, did an internship, and I've been uh, on full-time staff ever since, leading a worship team, um, six sets a week, six times a week. And uh, yeah, so that's a little about me. Good. My name is Ryan Kondo, um, from West Palm Beach, Florida, uh, born and raised there. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, most people were from New York or New Jersey that lived there, though. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> most people were from the north in West Palm Beach, except for me and a few others. Um, and so I uh, grew up in Florida, uh, parents divorced at a young age, gave my life to Jesus um, when I was five. Uh, I said yes to him, and um, it wasn't until... By the time I was in high school, I was doing crazy stuff, drugs, um, alcohol, uh, and then by the time I was in college, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll pause for a second. I wanted to be the MBA. That was my goal. I was this tall when I was like 10 years old. <laughs> so I was, you know, reading about Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley, and I wanted to be like them. So I tore my ACL my senior year, no more sports. My mom walked in while I was in bed with my knee being moved, and she gave me a guitar my senior year, and that's when I started playing guitar, and, uh, and that started my journey in worship, learning music, and, uh, you know, by the time I was in college, uh, again, was back doing the drugs and doing stupid stuff, and uh, I was encountered by the Lord when I was in White Sands, New Mexico, uh, camping out, huge sandstorm came through, and I had the fear of the Lord fall on me uh, because of the sandstorm probably, but also there was a real real terror of, I don't know what I'm doing with my life and I wanna, I wanna experience you and I wanna surrender my life to you in a real way. And so I give my life to Jesus fully. I said, whatever it looks like, I don't care what it looks like, it's yours. And so I said yes to Jesus um, and uh, went to college at UCF in Orlando, got my uh, college degree in teaching I was going to be a high school history teacher. Um, and then uh, a little bit of seminary at Asbury Seminary in Orlando, which is like the satellite campus of Kentucky. And uh, after two years of that, came to actually a one thing just like this. And uh, uh, they announced that they were doing music school. And that's actually what attracted me to come out to Kansas City. I always thought it was weird, the 24-7 worship and prayer. But I wanted to learn music, and I actually was getting ready to go to seminary and finish my seminary degree, and I really wanted to grow in theology. And so I, got, I love the idea of sitting in class, learning, uh, you know, Bible, and actually being able to sit in a prayer room and talk to the Lord about it, you know, for hours a day. And uh, I was excited about that. So that's actually got me out to Kansas City. When I got here, I fell in love with the prayer room. I fell in love with the reality of corporate intercession and prayer coming together as one, one body and seeing it, you know, when we came in, I would see people, I would see Catholics in the room and I would see, you know, a, you know, Presbyterians and all these different denominations come together in the prayer room. And I, yep. to me, that was beautiful because I was Assembly God kid, you know, I got saved in Assembly God Church, Southern Baptist Christian school, Methodist, you know, seminary. And then <laughs> now <laughs> I'm just like a spiritual mutt. So I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> I thought it was beautiful that the, just the, the melting pot of all the different, you know, denominations. Am I still on? Good. Uh, yeah, so that's actually what, you know, attracted me to the prayer room is the intercession, the corporate element coming together, and it's what kept me here. I fell in love with that. And just the reality that night and day, 24-7, since 1999, there's a place in South Kansas City, you know, starting on in a small trailer, yep. just these young people going, I love you, Jesus, and yep. singing songs to him because he's worthy of it. And so I just think that's, I think it's beautiful. And I know it's been, you know, all throughout church history, especially in the Catholic church, there's been tons of this, you know, and so we're only stepping into what's already been done. But anyways, that's me. I'm married and I have a little girl. I don't know if my wife's in here. We're yeah, we're all married, but my wife, Betty's awesome. <laughs> yes, she is. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. 
So just to uh, explain, I have a few questions about praise and worship. Maybe if just a couple of you answer each question, otherwise we'll be here till kingdom come. Yep. You know, so, and that will just I'll be... I'll let them answer. So, <laughs> um, so the first one, could you explain to us why is praise and worship important in the life of a believer? And what's the difference between praise and worship and just singing hymns or church songs? I, I have a comment. Um, so I just, wow. this is really timely for me because I, I just finished recording a, a record of hymns, actually. And it is sort of a thing unto itself. Um, the hymns are rich with theology. They tend to be uh, both worshipful at times, but a lot of it is really educating and preaching um, ourselves, our own consciences, like preaching the gospel over, you know, our minds because we we tend to need reminders of the truth about God's nature, His mm -hmm. character. Um, I did include two praise and worship songs on the record because I couldn't, I couldn't not. It was sort of like these are the these are the hymns of my generation in some ways. Shout to um, the Lord. Right? Yes, shout to the Lord. You did shout to the Lord, didn't you? Yes. It is a hymn. Done. <laughs> it did. No, I did even unto death, which you heard today in the in the main room, which Matt and I wrote together, and another song we wrote together called "New Every Morning." Um, I don't get very creative with my co-writing; it's just kind of like Matt and two other people. But um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is how I see it. So I would say um, praise and worship is important to me because, in terms of if we're talking about modern mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm. the the ever evolving tradition of you know praise and worship which communities like IHOP and communities like Bethel and communities like Passion City yeah. Church all sort of contribute to this growing canon of things. So I have two things to say. One is that I think, I think it's super important because um, God is always calling the believer to a life of uh, new, a new song. Now, nothing can be, almost something, nothing under the sun is new, but at the same time for the individual it's new. For the individual who's writing the song, it's new and it's fresh because they've never gone that deep with the Lord before, you know, whatever it is. And so the people that you sing these songs over may never have gone to a certain level with God before, as Keith said. He was toe deep. He thought he was all the way in. And so there's always this call for, I think, God to really increase, you know, f calling us to help um, stoke the, fl like the flames of the fire, I think. And I think praise and worship does that in a really special way. Um, I would also say I was reading about Charles Wesley, which I love Charles Wesley. He's written a lot of hymns that I really like. Mm -hmm. um, and in researching this hymns record, I kind of went through the canon of songs I grew up singing because I was raised in a, a Protestant tradition that only sang out of the hymnal, an Anglican and Methodist hymnal. And um, I discovered that Charles Wesley wrote like uh, 88,000 8, songs in his lifetime, and most of them were actually really terrible. He has a song... Um, about the, the, the Muslims, and he calls them like the, uh, what does he say, something like, um, and the Moor chief. Um, yeah, it's yeah. like the, the chief of Moors, let him not prevail, Lord, we worship you. It's just like some really bad songwriting. <laughs> and he, like, there are like 25 of his hymns that have actually lasted wow. through time. Yeah. And I think the reason, so the reason that the hymns that we still sing are so valuable is because they lasted out of thousands and thousands of songs composed. Like Fanny, Fanny Crosby wrote a similar number, 9,000 hymns in her life, and only about 25 of them made it. And the reason they're so important is because they had such an insight into the human condition and such a clarity of communication about God's mercy and love that they lasted. Yeah. So they're important. Not all hymns and not all songs are going to last, but I think it's good to look back and say what made it through all these generations and is still moving people's hearts now. I think one of the things that I, I uh, think about when I'm writing a song or even leading worship is, is not just, oh, this is a great worship experience. Even one thing, for example, this is four days, there's a lot of people here, um, but it's a conference, it's one event. And there are you know, 361 other days of the year that these young people are living their lives trying to withstand this onslaught from the world of, you know, trying to seek their love in, you know, in all these other places. And so for me, my, my desire with writing or even with leading with worship is not just to have a, a worship experience, but to have a experience that leads them to greater love for Jesus, yeah. which they would walk out of the back of the room and not say, I can't wait till next year when there's more light and there's more smoke and we all gather in this place. Though I love the worship experience like that. I love that. But um, how is that going to change them tomorrow? 
Can they sing the song tomorrow? Can they, will it lead them to sing the scripture? Because it's filled with scripture, um, yet personal, you know, so not just like preaching it down their throat. Um, so I think it's also, and I think in my opinion, um, you know, it's something the Lord's doing this day. Uh, sure, certainly he's raising up prayer, I think. But I think, you know, houses of prayer or the prayer movement or even the worship movement, all of that can be lumped into this. The Lord is restoring the first commandment to first place in the yeah. body of Christ. And he's saying, it's even, you know, what, what Matt was so well articulated earlier, forget your denominations, forget, not forget, but let some walls come down, come around the center focus of Jesus and love me, I think. Um, one of the things I was going to say, like the importance of praise and worship is I remember um, Mike takes all of us once a week and puts us all in a back room and just talks to us, has, you know, fireside chats with us. Hey, what's going on, this, that. And I remember one time, this was years ago, this was before we started having cameras, I think, even in the room, was he looked at us and he said, you know what, I'm going to tell you guys something. Um, pretty soon, the worship leaders are going to be the most famous people. You remember that? He goes, the way worship leaders will be the most famous. And he said, the reason, the reason is this. You will rarely hear people just in an elevator, in the grocery store, whatever, start quoting me. But you'll hear children, you'll hear teenagers, you'll hear people that all through the week, they will sing those songs. And I don't know if it's Plato, but he said, hey, don't give me the laws, don't give me any of that. Give me the music, give me the songs, and I will be able to shape an entire generation. I will shape the world from just the songs. So, I mean, yes, I, I agree with you as far as with the, the hymns and praise and worship, but it's like those songs are what shape the future. I mean, yes, I'm looking at my, my own children. I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. I... Um, do any of you guys know who uh, Rachel Fagatu with the little songbirds? Have you heard any of that stuff? They do children's praise and worship. My little daughter, she's almost two. She's not even two years old. We do a song. She has a song on it called Jesus is Coming Back Soon. Okay? And the song starts with, you know, Jesus is coming back soon. He's coming down from heaven. Well, you know what? My little daughter, she can't even put two words together. She's not even two. But you know what she does? She goes, Jesus. And she's reminding me every single time that she hits her little wrist that Jesus is coming back soon. And my children, they sing worship songs all day. And so they are in their spirit, in their brain, in their emotions, they're writing their future by those songs that they sing. Uh, Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, what we sing is what it shapes what we yep. believe. Yeah. I think it's important because it's what we're going to spend eternity exactly. doing. So <laughs> you might as well start liking it here. Be <laughs> real trying to get to heaven. <laughs> yeah, Wi-Fi. Like, I mean, they're singing one song like around the throne room. Holy, holy, holy. No one's sick of it apparently. So, like. Can I tell a really short? Yeah. Can I tell a really short story? Really short. It's, no, it's super short. Okay. So my 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 mom my mom is a fireball. She's this tall. Uh, not really. She's this tall, and she went to the eye doctor. This is a, this is just for the whole. Just so you understand the uh, Revelation four, which is where we see the creatures. She went to the optometrist, eye doctor, right? And the eye doctor was a believer. You know, they he believed in Jesus, read the Bible, all that stuff. So she asked him this question. She goes, "Can I ask you a question?" what would it be like, or what can you tell me about a creature that has eyes all over its body? What could you tell me about that creature? And the, 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 the eye doctor sat there for a second. Hmm, well, I can tell you this. That would be the most intelligent being ever. He goes, that would be the smartest creature. So I leave you with this. The smartest, most intelligent creature for all of the synaptic stork to get all the input that smartest creature never gets bored singing one word. It looks and it can experience it. It looks at God and it says, holy. Never bored. So I don't get bored of that either. Or at least I don't want to. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. For the IHOP worship leaders, uh, why is IHOP KC dedicated to 24 7 prayer? Some of you alluded to the fact you walked in like, this is crazy. Like, it seems a lot. I just want to make sure I understand the question, right? It's why 24-7? Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, I think of the Lord's Prayer, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. And if, if we understand what's happening in Revelation 4, it's, it's not stopping. I mean, it's continual. And like Matt just said, it's, we're going to be doing it into eternity. So there's this, this element of, I mean, it's unceasing, it's perpetual. And so uh, I truly believe uh, that there is a convergence between heaven and earth when you have, I mean, whether, regardless of the 24-7 or not, but when, when people are agreeing on earth with who Jesus is, and they're, they're, they're coming into agreement with what's happening in that throne room, there, something's happening. Yes. Um, and so I just, and I guess one of our uh, Bible teachers always says, okay, we can go to Walmart any time of day. All right. I can get a Big Mac at two in the morning. <laughs> Is Jesus not worth more than me getting a Big Mac at two in the morning? I mean, it's like, you're right. I mean, so ultimately I'm just saying that to say Jesus is worth night and day worship and prayer. That's good enough for me. Well, and oh, Father, great, I mean, that's, that's a great answer. You, you pray, I mean, you're, you're a priest, you pray the liturgy of the hours. And, and so it, this is not, it's not new. You know what I mean? It, it, in some ways, it's taking the charism of what religious life sort of lives and moves and operates in, which is an ordered day. And it's sort of structuring it in a modern way yeah. that I think is appealing to young people. It's the, it's the continues the breath of the church, right? Yeah. Yeah, so just to explain, if you don't know what Liturgy of the Hours is, it's the Psalms and scriptures and readings of the church fathers that priests and religious pray at different times throughout the day. We call it to sanctify the day. But this is being prayed by thousands, if not millions, of priests and religious all around the world. So again, just as we're talking about this, incessant praise going up to God from the church around the world. And the word that we use, which I think you alluded to, is communion. That there, there isn't just the church here on earth, there's a church in heaven, and we're joined. There's this communion of saints. So Beautiful. Thank you. It's great to hear. Um, how do you lead your worship team on stage and beyond. This is for anyone. And do you ever get bored doing the same thing on a daily basis? Nope. You don't get bored? <laughs> um, how do I lead my worship team on stage, like practical, like, lead, like stage leadership? Okay, um, I'll just give a couple of things I do. I do mostly, the way I lead my band, um, well one, we practice off stage, which is really helpful. Super helpful. <laughs> they really like to follow me, and if we sit down beforehand and go, this is where we're going, give them a road map, they're really happy. And, uh, and I'm happy, and everyone in the rooms, they don't know it, but they're happier than they would be if we didn't practice. <laughs> and so that's, that's number one. But also on stage, I use a lot of body language and vocal cues. And so I do, I do a little bit of hand cues, but it's really hard to do when you have a guitar in your hand. I, if I play piano, I'd be able to, you know, go to one hand. But um, so I, I, you know, when I lift up my guitar, the, the head of my guitar, they know I'm at the one, the beginning of the next measure, I'm bringing it down. Um, if I start stomping my feet or, <laughs> or, you know, kind of moving my body in a certain way, my drummer knows to start building it, and so does the rest of the band. And so they're watching me to follow. Um, and then also vocally, um, I don't have to tell my band, you know, if I'm going from the verse to the chorus. Um, because usually I'll sing it out before I go to the chorus, or I just go up a little bit at the end of the verse and kind of build vocally into the chorus so that they just know, and actually helps, I think it helps the room as well, know where, where I'm going. So there's just some things that, we, that I do. I know everyone's different as far as worship team. That's stuff I do in the house of prayer when you're leading two hours in a row, you know, and one set, it's like, it's a lot to fill, and so it just helps me navigate those two hours, both in the songs and, the, and in the, uh, the spontaneous, you know, prayer time that we do. Uh, I'll answer both your questions really quickly. The first thing is about uh, how do you lead your teams. I'll focus more like off stage, and the Lord's been speaking to me about this even just recently that worship leader is not one of the fivefold um, gifting of the church there, and so finding out that you can't just uh, I'll speak from IHOP's perspective, and I'll, I'll do a real talk here, not sugarcoating it. You know, you can't just have a platform ministry, and 
it's not that glorious at IHOP. Like I, I do 6 a.m. for example, so there's like 20 people in the room. So it's not like I'm getting my pride stroked at 6 a.m. in the morning when I want to be in bed. But um, uh, I'm not just a guy who does something on a platform. In my opinion, for a worship leader uh, at IHOP specifically, the rubber really meets the road uh, off stage with your team. And I feel called to, uh, to lead in worship, prayer, and discipleship. And I think as worship leaders in local churches or houses of prayer or wherever you are, I think uh, the discipleship of your worship team is so key. And so really we're pastors in a lot of ways. We're putting out fires. Uh, I mean, I'm with my band probably 20 hours a week. And so you can't just be fake that much. And people are late and people are in sin and da 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 et cetera. It's just, it's real life, you know, and we're all there. We're all full time. We're in each other's space. You have, you know, uh, intense conversations, whatever. And so I think you just have to really... We're pastors, and we have to exercise that muscle. Um, what was the second part of the board, question? Do you get bored? Yes, do you get bored? Having straight talk, like, uh, again, I'm speaking from the House of Prayer perspective, uh, 100%. I mean, you do. Like, there's, uh, but I, I think that's not specific to, oh, man, you lead worship all the time. You must be bored. If you work at Walmart or at a factory, you're probably bored. I, I, from people that I've talked to and, and been in a relationship with, if you're a pop star, if you're an NFL superstar, sports star, it ends up being another stadium, another crowd of people, another hotel room, another X, Y, Z. You have to keep the flame going on the inside or anything. I mean, life is mundane. Life is boring. I mean, we can take our cues from uh, Jesus and the apostle Paul. Like I just read this book uh, called Anonymous about the, uh, the years of Jesus's life pre-ministry. Like if he didn't have a, a, supernat a supernatural fast forward button from 12 to 18, which is a little bit of an awkward stage for Jesus, he just kind of fast forwarded through it. He lived every second of every minute of every day. And so just like him, we're called to commune with our Father in a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think it's with any job. Uh, I have a funny priest uh, board story. So it was <clears throat> during a mass and um, this priest friend of mine was looking around the churches at the end of communion and it was like the fourth mass he had done that Sunday and, uh, and plus he'd had to go to a hospital and anoint somebody, you know, in the middle of the night. It was, it's like one of those weekends where everything is stacked up against you. And at the end of communion, he was thinking to himself, man, I really got to change uh, the flowers around the church. And he got up to pray and he went, instead of saying like, our heavenly, or, um, our heavenly father, he said, our heavenly flower. I mean, father. <laughs> So I, I, I just, I say that because I go, I think it's in the human, it is in the human condition that like we're meant for routine, but then once we get in routine, our hearts sort of end up betraying us, you know, yeah. or sometimes your body, you're just tired. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine getting up at 6 a.m. and leading worship. <laughs> like uh, it, like the idea of doing like it. It takes a tremendous amount of discipline, and I think being in ministry takes a tremendous amount of presence. And, uh, and that's the, to me, that's, I think, the thing, too. Like, it's, in everything that you're doing in ministry, it's the ministry of presence, of being present with people. Because yeah, Jesus was just so good at being present to people. And uh, I'm, I, I mean, working at a, I worked at a parish for 13 years. And that was the thing day in and day out. But I'm sure you can speak to, too, like now being on the road, like it's, it's a little bit, my life's a lot different than these guys. But when we're on a tour, we're on a, like, we're on, next weekend, we're, uh, or Sunday, we leave for a week. And there's 13, 14 people. I'm bringing my son with me. So there's 14 people on a tour bus. And we're just in each other's space. And so there is that thing of, like, you have to, um, you, none of us, there is no off button there you know what I mean there's sure there's when we're playing music and when we're done but um we we often me and my team talk a lot more and more about just how the ministry of relationship is in some ways it feels like that's what that's why God has you out doing what you're doing in the first place it's not really about music um it's about his glory and then it's about how is how is he changing you you know how's he transforming your life so thank you thank you yeah strikes me it's about authenticity. Yeah. Like if you're authentic off of the stage, then you'll be authentic on the stage. Like worship is life. Life is worship. Yep. So thank you. Um, just a couple of questions before we move on to discussions on unity. What influences you most as a worship leader? Musically or? I don't know. Yeah. 
I was just given this question. <laughs> However you want to answer, Audrey. Caffeine. Um, I know for, for myself, as a songwriter, I am heavily, heavily influenced by literature and um, poetry. So I have quite a lot of songs that are like Matt says, he plagiarizes dead people. That's what I do. Um, <laughs> they can't come after me now. Yeah. Not yet. And um, so I, I'm really inspired by things that are poetic, that are sort of... Uh, and even, even honestly by, by fiction, because one thing I like to say is that, uh, you know, aside from the scriptures obviously being a main source of inspiration for any, I think, worship writer... Um, the reason that I'm so inspired by literature, classic works of literature, is that I, they are classic precisely because they, their authors possessed um, an incisive and uh, prophetic insight into the human condition. Otherwise, the novels wouldn't have lasted. Yeah. So I, say, I feel the same way about hymns that I do about um, novels in the sense that I, I read them and in them I encounter myself. And in encountering myself, I end up asking myself the big questions about life, about prayer, about why I'm here and why I am the way that I am. And then when I do that, I encounter the Lord again and again uh, because I have that, you know, bent. I'm bent to sort of encounter him in those questions. And so um, a lot of my songwriting is very influenced by those novels and by those poems and by the scriptures. Um, but like I shall not want, I'll use as an example of where I came across a prayer called the Litany of Humility. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, Come on, that's all. <laughs> only the Catholics cheer for this prayer, okay? <laughs> I, um, I have so many nights I go out and I say, have you guys ever heard of the Litany of Humility? And it's just total crickets. And then I know I'm, you know, in a Catholic town when I hear people going, woo! <laughs> um, I, uh, I read this prayer, it's by a cardinal, that uh, Cardinal Delval, Mary Delval, is that right? And it says, you know, from the need to be understood, from the need to be accepted, from the fear of being lonely, all these things, deliver me, O God. But then on and on it goes to say uh, that others may be preferred to myself. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire that. Yeah. Wow. Now, I wrote this song, and I thought, I'm not putting that part in, because <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm not ready. I, but the Lord, I, I read that prayer, and I was like, ugh. My impulse was like, ugh, put this away. And the Lord said, no, I want you to, I want you to write this. I want you to write a song based on this so that you're forced to pray this repeatedly. Mm. And so I wrote the song. I kind of came up with the idea. I went to my friend Brian, who I've written a few songs with, and we finished it. And then I put it out on a record, and it was the most popular song on the record by like 8,000 miles. And so now I have to sing it everywhere I go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and I'm thankful. You know, so I'm very inspired by, by writings of, of people who've gone before me. And I, but I, again, I think, I think that you take those things and you shape them and you add your own lens and you add your own, you know, your own gifts, your own history, um, and they become new. They become new songs. I think all, as a worship leader and as, even as an artist and as a poet, we can relate to David and how he, he just lays it all out there in the Psalms. You can just read them, sing them with your guitar or your piano, and, uh, and it's just, I just love David and how he was so raw before God. In some Psalms, he opens up you know, like accusing, not accusing, but complaining to God. And by the end of the song, he's saying, no, I trust you. And I just love that. I love how he's so real with the Lord. And it gives, it gives me as a worship leader courage on those days when I'm like, I don't want to be here. Or, or when I'm, you know, different seasons of my life where I went through like extreme pain of loss and, and, and pain. And, and, and I've been able to come to the Lord and, and worship him. Um, and even be honest with him in the worship, you know, and, crying and uh and but by the end of the end of the you know set or in the song you know declaring his faithfulness and how good he is in the midst of the pain you know so that's why i love i love specifically the psalms the word of god entirely but uh i love the psalms yeah thank you thank you yeah wonderful wonderful as we kind of segue into our discussion on unity how can praise and worship help the church in taking the steps towards deeper unity. So we're combining the two areas that we're talking about. I think Matt said it earlier. Yeah, right. I, I, yeah. What Matt no, said. Matt. You already answered that one. Yes, something? Go 
Oh, did we say it earlier? Yeah. I think yeah. So. I mean, just, I'm making sure. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'd love to hear from you guys. Yeah, I would. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Matt wants to hear from me. <laughs> we always give John the mic because he loves it. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Um, no, I just, well, I love, you know, you just start with, um, with music and how music brings people together. And, uh, you know, you can you could name a, a worship artist, a pop artist, and so many people from so many different backgrounds love so and so. You know, name the artist, name the musician, or whatever. So there's something about music inherently, I think, that just draws such a broad, uh, a broad, what am I trying? To, you know, broad yeah. group of people. So, yeah. So, I think you even start with that, and how, what a gift it is from the Lord, and. Uh, and then I think also just the, um, you know, worship songs that are uh, filled with the Word of God, filled with Scripture, you know, that's, the Word of God is, it's, it, everyone that, that calls themselves a follower of Jesus uh, is, is, is uh, you know, acknowledging and agreeing with the Word of God, uh, even though there's, you know, there's maybe some different interpretations and you know, different, different spheres, but we're all saying, no, we, we believe in the authority of the scripture. Yeah. And so you take music and you take the Bible and you, you know, you, you start there and that, that right, that's, that's going to draw people together. I don't, I, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, music is a universal language, which is kind of what he said already. But, you know, in my opinion, it's happening already in many ways. We just maybe haven't put uh, the language to it. I mean, the fact that songs that are written by what you may call charismatic movements in the church or charismatic denominations are being sung in Lutheran churches and all yeah. these different... Yeah. It's a big deal, and I think that uh, that's a beautiful thing that I'm observing. I'm sure Matt can speak on more. Um, but I think it's kind of what John said. I mean, we see in the book of Revelation numerous times there's, there's singing that takes place in heaven, and they're singing that's going to take place in heaven. How every nation, tribe, and tongue is going to sing a song together, I have no idea. Is our language going to change? I don't think so. So we have all these different languages in the earth. How are we all going to come together and sing a song? I don't know. But that's, like, we're headed that direction. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's happening already in this, in this time. And I think, of two, I think of two phrases. And um, I think of the idea that, you know, in Psalms, David talks about how that Jesus is enthroned He's enthroned on the praises of his people. And it's like, we're not serving a different king. You know what I mean? When we lift up Jesus, when it says another phrase, when Jesus is lifted up, he's going to draw everybody, all men. It's not just a few of them. It's all men. When he is lifted up, and he said, we, we've been saying it, and everybody's been saying it, when we love each other, when we do the two commandments, when we, we do loving God with all of our being, we love each other, the world sees it and says, oh, this is real. We're lifting him up and everybody's rallying around. So, from the positive to the challenge. How can we grow closer to each other when our theology and practices often differ so drastically? Whoa. Well... Uh, I think once again, th there has to be ecumenism 1.0, if we want to call it that, was uh, it's basically mostly an academic endeavor, uh, usually involved the publishing of some kind of paper that was read uh, in a colloquium of sorts, and might have resulted in a few beards pulled out and wailing and gnashing of teeth and then it's people leaving. Um, I think ecumenism 2.0, it starts around the common confessions, yeah. common theology. I said the Trinity, um, revelation of God in the person of Jesus. He's fully God and fully man. Um, his death on the cross, salvation. Um, and I think once we establish that and we're 
are able to worship publicly together around that. See, it comes down to, is your model of ecumenism, Keith and I were talking about this earlier today, is your model of ecumenism the story of the prodigal son or is it the story of Emmaus? Because I think most people's idea of ecumenism is actually the story of the prodigal son and they're the older one and the other person is the younger one who squandered yeah. his inheritance yeah. and just needs to come to his senses and come back. Yeah. First of all, that's not even the real shock of the parable. The shock of the parable is that his dad runs out to meet him and lifts up his skirt, which is horrendous for a Middle Eastern man to do. It, it's God disgracing himself. So that, that's not even the parable. But what Emmaus is, Emmaus is two disciples who are disappointed and on the way. And on the way, Jesus meets them and starts to talk to them and reveals himself yep. to both of, them, both of them in their midst while they're dealing with their disappointments and they're dealing with their struggles. And then they come to recognize who he is and then they go tes te testify to it. Weren't our hearts we, burning? Yes, and can we really focus in on the fact that in the scriptures he uh, spoke to them but they didn't know him until they were at table yeah. with each other. Yeah. Yep. And I just want to publicly repent. I, I became a Catholic eight, nine years ago with a fundamentalist mind and a fundamentalist heart. And I was very, very zealous and I, I was very, very preachy. And I was like, all Christians need to be Catholics. This is how it is. You know, we are the mother of church. We are the fullness of truth, blah, 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 blah. And although I do acknowledge that there's some primacy in the sense of historically, yes, like the Catholic Church is the oldest, we've yep. been around the longest, but that is not, I, I, I think I learned, you know, pride comes before a fall. Even when, even when I might believe that, um, let's say like Jesus established the church and it grew into Catholicism, I believe that and I'm going to be frank about it because this is ecumenical. I also believe that there is nothing so black and white as I am able to make it in this life because God, uh, I don't think all Christians should be Catholic. And I want to say that publicly. I think that's a really strange thing to say um, on a stage, but I, I want to say that because I believe that God's will for people is so much bigger than their journey on one point of their life. I became Catholic at the age of 24 or whatever, and I believe that was God's will for my life, but I am, it's a continuum. Yeah. I'm on a journey, and we are all pilgrims. Yeah. And what, we're really, what, what, what all Christians are supposed to be is in heaven, together, praying together. Yeah. And we will all find our way there by whatever measure or whatever method or whatever God's, you know, guidance becomes. And I, I want to say that on the stage. And I think that we can, and in that context around the table with people, you can have conversations about this without it feeling threatening and divisive yeah. because right. we know where we're going. We have a common goal and a common vision. I think a couple of things too, like, first of all, this is not what you just said is not scandalous or new. It's actually the Second Vatican Council, their document on ecumenism. It's just a lot of people haven't read it. Yeah. But basically what it said was before, and I think sometimes um, people can sort of have this view that if a Christian is outside of what we would call full communion with the church, they are anathema. Right. They're essentially cut off. And the church changed its language at the Second Vatican Council and said that that's not the case. And there's actually... We were wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And... It's possible. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a deeper understanding of the fact that we are a pilgrim church on a journey from earth to heaven. Yeah. And along the way, Jesus wants to bring us into reconciliation, not only with himself, but with each other. Yeah. And, um, and so what that means on a practical level is that when I go receive communion at a church, I feel the sting of disunity. I don't just feel union with Christ. I actually experience, because my wife's not Catholic. So when I receive communion at a Catholic church, I'm very much aware of the fact that my wife can't receive communion. And I have to contend with that sting. And when I go to her church, um, I have to contend with the sting of not receiving communion at her church. So the goal isn't that we sort of water down our differences and I just sort of yeah. become a marginalized Catholic and they become you know, marginalized, you know, members of International House of Prayer, not non-denominational Christians. <laughs> yeah, the, no, we're, the, we're all from very different yeah. backgrounds. <laughs> the, the goal is, the goal is a rigorous, healthy discussion, but it's amongst brothers who are part of a family yeah. and not strangers who are enemies. Yeah. And, and I think that 
if we're honest with ourselves, most of our apologetics and most of our conversations are basically designed at convincing someone that they're wrong and we're right. Instead of just saying, this is why I believe what I believe and I believe it with all my heart and someone else saying, amen, brother, and I respect you for that and I want to understand why you believe what you believe. And when we come to a greater understanding, maybe we're actually starting to experience a foretaste of what real communion looks yeah. like. Yeah, my apologetics aren't, my apologetics isn't a sword. It's a shield. It's a shield. Even, I mean, just to, to quote Francis, one quick thing he said even this morning when he came out, this is Francis' second year at this conference, Francis Chen, and for him to say the statement again, you know, well, you know, I had people uh, say, when, I, when, you go, when you go there, don't affirm yes. Mike Bickle or IHOP, whatever. Right. It's like, but I'm going to do it. I love Mike Bickle. Oh, I love beautiful. IHOP. For me, as a 30-year-old, younger Christian leader, I look at that and say, I'm going to follow that man because he is he's saying, we don't agree on everything, but he, yet he's, Mike Bickle's giving him the platform and he's praising Mike Bickle and there's different, uh, same foundational beliefs, different up here beliefs, whatever. And that, that just, I, mean, I could weep uh, hearing Francis say that and that's just so beautiful to me. Yeah, I, I think that I think that a lot of this is going to be, amongst younger generations, is us first um, being able to missionally actually participate in ministry together. Yeah. Yep. Like, visibly in the world. Yeah, you can clap for that. That's, we should applaud that. Because, um, you know, because Francis even, that was the thing he alluded to it, too. He's like, he goes, look, it's not like, it's not just about singing songs together. It's actually about, like, if we can, if we can somehow find different missions, you know, and the U.S. Catholic bishops, they've been, they've been sort of advocating for this. Individual bishops have been advocating for it. There was a gathering last May in Phoenix where um, Protestant and Catholic leaders came together and had a time of worship and also had a time of repentance. It was endorsed by the Pope. Um, it, and it was, it was basically this, it was called John 17. And it was basically this recognition of um, Jesus prayed that they would be one can, can we agree that that is a burden that should matter more to us and that we need to share more? And it's not one that's necessarily motivated out of guilt and shame as much yeah. as it's devoted a, motivated out of a desire to be in fellowship with one another. It's yeah. Family. And, and so it's like, wow, if we could do that and find tangible ways, it's not like me just inviting these guys and say, hey, I think you should come to Mass and just receive communion. Right. Because that, that actually... It, it betrays what we both believe. But it's like, hey, if we can grieve over the fact that we can't receive communion together. Because to me, like, that's always the thing. Like, you get, a, you get a unity gathering together, and we're Christians. It always ends up, communion always ends up being, like, the spot. But if we could actually not run away from the sting of it and just go, man, we're going to stand here and suffer, like Francis said, and we're going to suffer and grieve the fact that we're not around the table together and say, Lord, make that prayer true. We can't, we can't figure it out. We don't know how exactly you're going to do it, but it really is going to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And that, okay, last thing, it's, it, I believe, I mean, this is like my whole life mission. Like, uh, it, it is when you, cause you asked the question, you're like, okay, how can we do this? It's like, we can't do this. Yeah. And until both people are willing to admit publicly and go, we can't do this. We can't, we can't repair all that needs to be repaired. But it takes the Lord. And if we can stand together in agreement that the Lord will repair it, that's like a first massive huge step. Huge step. He's going to do it. Yeah. It's just, do we want to be the generation that sees it? Amen. Amen. Strikes me we have to desire it, first of all. Yeah. yeah, huge. We have to desire it. Because if we say that it's, everything's fine, it's not honest. Yeah, yeah. No. It's not true to God's heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if we're honest enough to say, yeah, it hurts. But let's walk together, as you yeah. said, Matt, yeah. on the road. Yeah. Knowing that this is the Lord's work, the work of the Holy Spirit. Because if we desire it, then we pray for it, then it can begin to happen. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And I think it begins here. 
quite honestly, things like this, getting yeah. to know one another. It, yeah, I'm The amount of young people that have stopped it, me yeah. and said, yo, what is that, man? <laughs> <laughs> What's the get up? <laughs> you know? And then we have this great conversation. Yeah. I prayed with a number of people, young people from all over the country in the aisles because we've met one another. That's yes. awesome. it's beautiful. And they've yeah. said, I love that. It's beautiful. You know? And that's where it begins. So Amen. let us continue. All right, final little question so we can move into our ministry time. <laughs> Just wow. trying to think where to go from he there. He didn't write these. I think this is why he's so surprised by all of them. He's like, oh. oh, don't ask that last one. What's that? I said, you, you don't have to, you can, we can. Yeah, yeah that's good. Leave yeah. it there. Yeah, we'll leave Thank it. Thank you. Last one. That's good. That was a good last that's one. That was a good last one. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. We can yeah. move, move into ministry time. No pressure. Time. Thank you. Anything with big schism in it, I, I don't know if I'm ready to go there right now. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, we, we can just pray. <laughs> Let's just pray. That's good. That's good. Because it seems that that's where we led it to. We got to pray. I think so. Yeah, so. we have to pray together. So, let's pray together. Thank you, Father, that through the grace of the cross, the gift of our faith in you, the gift of our baptism, that we can come together as brothers and sisters. Thank you for these men, Lord, who have responded to your call in their lives. Thank you for their willingness to share that with us this afternoon. Just ask Holy Spirit that you come. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, that you are the principle of unity in the church. Yes. That without you, none of this is possible. We cannot love one another. We cannot reach out to one another. We cannot dialogue with one another unless you make it possible for us. So just ask that you would come now and anoint these brothers and sisters for worship. As we worship, we will grow in unity. As we're drawn to you, Father, we would be transformed. That our hearts would be less hard, our minds less fixed. And we'd be molded by you, Holy Spirit, by your love by the burning fire of your love. Thank you, Father, this is your desire, that we would be one. Yes, Jesus. Give to us a greater desire, greater desire for you, Lord, for your heart, for the desire of your heart, for unity amongst us as Christians. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just come before you and we join with the prayer of your son, Jesus. And we say, Father, we desire. Father, we desire. Father, we desire. Father, we desire. We desire. Just as you prayed that we would be with you where you are that we would be with you where you are, that we will be one as you are one. That we would be one, Jesus. As it says in your word, that we would know the height, the depth, the length, the width, 
of your great, great love that we would understand and perceive and know with all of the saints, with all of the saints, that we would be filled with the knowledge of God, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, filled with the knowledge of God. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and my sisters from every walk of life, Lord, from every denomination, specifically, Lord, the charismatic Catholics, the Catholics in this room, Lord, those who have held the line, God. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I bless them. Bless them in the name of Jesus. I bless them. I bless them. Father, help. Help me and help the rest of the Protestant church, Lord. Help us to receive our brothers and sisters. Help us to receive them, Lord. Receive them, Lord. And I just feel this right now. The Lord says, there's no us in them. There's us. There's no us in them. There's us. There is no us in them. There is us. There is no us in them. There is us. Just draw us, draw us together into you, Jesus. So it says in Ephesians 4 that the unity of Christ, that we would all be grown that we would all grow into the head of Christ. We'd all grow into the head of the church, Christ. In unity, all of us together, Lord. You do it, Lord. We can't do it. Help us, Lord. We need help. Thank you that you will help us. But help us. God, I pray that you'd forgive each of us for any arrogance or any pride that we have in our hearts, root it out for us, Lord, with your spirit's conviction. And I pray that we would truly apprehend the mystery um, that your glory is your mercy, God, that if you delight in showing mercy, then we ought to show delight in showing mercy, um, that we should desire that more than judgment. Even though um, we may want to pursue truth with a with our, our zeal and our passion, what we should more passionately want, Lord, is to seek to love each other, to seek to show mercy to each other. And I pray that you would unite us behind that vision, Lord. Do a supernatural work. In my heart, Lord, I repent of my arrogance in the past. I repent of my, my judgment of my brothers and sisters. I pray that you would intervene. God, save me from that. Save me from that cancer, from that poison, God, from that toxin, and make me a new creation again. Uh, make me loving, make me merciful, make me receptive. I pray you grant us the grace to devote our lives to, to this work, which is your prayer, your desire, Lord Jesus. Father, I want to uh, repent on behalf of myself and, and other Protestants for uh, just ignorant assumptions. Uh, related to the Catholic Church and Catholic believers. Things that, Lord, that have uh, injured the church. Father, I just repent. Father, I ask that you would give me, that you would give us, all of us, God, give us your eyes for one another. I ask that we would see one another the way that you do. I ask for your heart. Lord, that, that the, when you look at the believers, God, Catholic believers, Protestant believers, God, give us your eyes. Let us, let us see one another the way you do and operate in that same spirit of compassion that Jesus does. Yes, Lord, we confess that we need you. Even as we said, we can't do it on our own, Lord. And so we confess our need for you, Holy Spirit, to come and move in the church, Lord, to unite us, to bring, uh, Lord, true unity in, in the bride, God, that we'd be one bride that, uh, just as you said, Lord, that we would be known, that we, they would know we are Christians by our love for one another, Lord, that 
that the the non-believers would be drawn to you jesus because of our love for one another that they'd be drawn to your beauty and your glory because they see broken people with jacked up lies loving one another god and and not not being divisive and so i just ask for that lord would you bring unity would you bring love let love abound in your church god let love love abound still more and more in your church god come holy spirit do a work that we cannot do. Yes, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for this first step C, Lord, even of this gathering that's taken place uh, in tandem with the One Thing Conference. And just as leaders at the International House of Prayer, we want to say thank you for coming. And we want to clearly say we need you, that we are the, the beautiful body and bride of Christ. And that, uh, Lord, I ask that this would just be even just a first fruit down payment of what's to come in the future that even it may look like this in the future it may not who knows though but that you would lead it and we just say as uh leaders at the international house of prayer we uh we need you we stand with you guys we are one we are joined with you um and what i ask that you would do what's even happening here in kansas city at this little gathering these four days at the one thing conference Lord, do it across the globe i ask you to begin to touch the hearts of priests the hearts of bishops and pastors and deacons and elders Elders, well, that a, a movement of unity, a movement of true uh, love for Jesus, unhindered love for Jesus would arise from your body in Jesus' name.
the voice here, sing it again forever. Oh, forever he is glorified. Forever he is lifted high. Forever he is risen. He is alive. He is alive. We love you, Jesus. This is a song of praise to the Lord.
another same love that's in you put it in us the same love that's inside of you put it in us the same love Jesus. form it in our hearts right now Same love, same love. Give us the same heart. Same heart. Give us the same love. We'll be like you, Jesus. Give us the same heart that you have. Give us the same love. place them on your heart. Sing this out. Make us one as you. You're praying over yourself. As you are one. As you are one. This is your prayer. Make us one as you are one. As you are one. As you are one. One has you together. One has you together. One as you together. Make us one. Make us one together. Christ. One together in you. One together in Christ. Together. Make us one. Together in Christ, together in you, together in Christ, together in Christ, together in you, together in Christ. This is what we want, God. Together in Christ, together in you, together in Christ. This is what we're crying out for, Lord. Together in Christ, together in you, together in Christ, oh God. Oh, in our God. Is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God, and our God is an awesome God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God, yes, He 
Yes, our God, our God is an awesome God. He reigns, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yet yeah, our, our God is an awesome God. God, one more time. And our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yeah, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Let's sing, I'll stand. Time just the voices, I'll stand and I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours all I am is yours Lord all I am is yours all I am is yours Lord all I am is yours Maybe just as a way to close, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. The prayer that Jesus gave us, the prayer that, that we pray as Christians. Maybe we can join together, as we said in our song, hand in hand. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the church said? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.